We're listening to John this morning, John's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning with verse 43, we'll be reading through verse 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly, I tell you. You will see heaven opened in the sun and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, God, give us ears to hear. Words that call us to come and see. So Lord, give us feet that we may go, eyes that we may see, and lives open to change. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Well, let me ask you something. Has this ever happened to you? You've had a long day at work. It doesn't matter if it's at the office, on a job. And, and, and maybe you come home and, and you fix yourself a glass of tea, or maybe something stronger, like Coke. <laughs> what? What did you think I was talking about? <laughs> you kick your shoes off, you just sort of flop down on that worn out end of the couch, or maybe in your favorite chair that's worn just right, you know, so nobody else can really be comfortable in it but you. And just when it feels like all the worry, all the stress, all the frustration of the day just starts to slide off of you, your lovely spouse calls from the kitchen. Hey, babe, come in here and look at this. Or maybe, maybe it's your sweet little child down the hall or upstairs in their bedroom playing. Mommy, Daddy, come look what I did. That ever happened in your house? Now, I know y'all are all better people than I am, because when it happens in my house, the first thing I do is say, what? (laughs) Which then proceeds to, you got to come see this. But I just sat down. No, come on. Can't you just tell me? Now we're screaming across the house. and No, come see what I did. Now, if I'm honest with you, most of the time when Cole asks to come and see what he's made or what he's drawn or what he's set up in his bedroom, I have the slightest notion as to what it is or what it's supposed to be, but I do what every good parent ought to do. I get up, I go down the hall, and when I see what he's done, I go, wow, what in the world is that? Look at that. Show me what it does. How'd you do that? Now, before I I ever even get up from my seat, I know it's nothing really amazing, right? I know it's nothing that's going to make us a lot of money. I know it's nothing that's going to change the world. But I know that he's proud of it. I know that he's got something he wants to show off to mama and dad, uh, something he wants to share with us. And so every single time, whether it's a weird-looking stick figure whether it's drawn with a marker on a a cardboard box, whether it's some unidentifiable blob of Play-Doh and he's mixed the colors and I really don't want to be frustrated about that, but he's wanting to show it off, 
Or maybe it's just some random stack of blocks or magnet tiles with a hot wheel stuck in it. Every single time, I'm going to get up and go see it because he's just so proud of it. Because he believes what he's done is worth showing off. Because he believes it's worth sharing with somebody else. And hearing about it just won't do. And, and he can't find the words. I don't know. Come here. Come see what I did. Maybe that's why Philip wouldn't walk off and leave Nathaniel alone. I mean, all we're told, really, so far. I mean, we're not even a full chapter in to John. All we're really told about Philip is that Jesus finds him in Galilee and says to him, Follow me. We're not told if Jesus happened to mention to Philip why he should follow him. We get that with Andrew and Peter in the other Gospels. Come and follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. We're not even told that in this about Andrew and Peter. Andrew comes along and he drags Peter with him. But Jesus finds Philip in Galilee and says, follow me. We're not even told what Philip is doing. Was he a fisherman like Peter and Andrew? Was he working for the family business like James and John? Was he a tax collector like Levi, a zealot like Simon? Or was he just some guy out minding his own business on an otherwise regular day? We don't know. We're not told, at least not yet. All we're told is that after Philip was found by Jesus, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses and all the prophets wrote. Now we can gather from what Jesus says later on that, that, that Nathanael was under a fig tree when Philip found him. So what does that mean? I'll give you the short answer. I don't know. It depends on who you ask. Some folks point to the symbolism of a fig tree as, a, as an image of Israel. That Nathaniel is under this fig tree and so he's under the, the sort of old ways of Israel. I don't know. I had a professor in seminary who told me that, that, that really what happened was fig trees were planted really close to people's homes. And when they grew up real tall, they'd bind the limbs together and sort of pull them down like a little porch. And people would often go out under the fig tree and pray. And have little times of devotion. I don't know. Still some say it's really just a way for Jesus to be really specific. Sort of like, I saw you walking out of the Star Mart the other day. That'll kind of make you, what? What was I doing at the Star Mart that day when you saw me? Maybe. Personally, I'm not terribly certain in any direction. But I know, I do know this. If somebody's sitting down under a fig tree... Chances are they're not really doing anything too strenuous. If you're sitting under a fig tree, you're probably taking it easy. Maybe resting beneath its broad leaves, out of the blistering sunshine. Maybe taking a break to indulge in one of nature's sweet blessings. Though I'm not too big on figs, I'd rather find a pear tree or a pecan tree. But either way, Nathaniel was sitting under this fig tree when Philip comes to him and says, We have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. Now, I can imagine Nathaniel sitting under that tree is stirred a bit. I mean, I can almost see it. Nathaniel sitting under that tree, maybe taking a break, maybe reading a good book. Got a glass of milk and a peanut butter fold over next. Y'all know what that is, right? piece of bread, peanut butter. Some people look at me weird when I say that. But there he was, maybe just eating a little peanut butter sandwich, glass of milk, and his neighbor Philip strolls right by, starts in on what he's been up to. Nathaniel, according to Jesus a few verses later, we know is, is an upstanding Israelite, has a strong prayer life, works, worships at the temple regularly, is up on his memory verses for Sunday school, tries not to cuss, tries not to think bad thoughts, you know, all the good things good church folks do. That's the image we're supposed to have of Nathaniel. So when Philip says to him, we found the one about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, you can bet that Nathaniel had some sense of what Philip was talking about, and he likely got excited. 
Well, I can imagine that before Philip finished his sentence, Nathaniel slammed his book shut, shook the crumbs out of his beard, started tucking in his shirt tail, buttoning up his shirt collar, you know, getting everything. Is my hair straight? Is it laying down? Getting his shoes back on? He got ready quick to find out, where's this one about whom Moses and the prophets wrote? But then, as quickly as he got excited, his spring unwound when he heard who this one was that Philip was talking about. Or to be more specific, when he heard where this one was from. Philip tells him, Nathaniel, that it's Jesus, common name, son of Joseph, a common name. You might as well be saying this is Jim, son of John, right? From Nazareth. I can see it. Nathaniel is all worked up. He's lit up, thinking he's found something. And then his countenance just falls. There's a slight frustration, maybe in throwing his half-eaten sandwich down, losing his place in his book as he untucks his shirt and kicks his shoes back off and says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth. Nazareth. Do you know how many Old Testament prophets came from Nazareth? That's a question you can answer. Do you know how many Old Testament prophets came from Nazareth? I'll give you a hint. It's less than one. <laughs> Do you know how many notable events took place in Nazareth? Do you know how many tour buses stopped in Nazareth? Nazareth. I bet you can guess how many times that little town is even mentioned in the Hebrew Bible and you don't even have to read it. None. Nazareth was a place of no consequence. A one stoplight town and it was blinking most of the time. A place where no one seemed to be from. A place where nothing seemed to happen. Can anything good Come out of Nazareth. I heard if you drive into Nazareth, they'll steal the hubcaps off your car. Nazareth? Oh, they live in tents on the side of the road in Nazareth. Nothing's going on in Nazareth. Nazareth? Don't go down there. Don't get out of the car. You'll get shot. Don't go to Nazareth. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. Seems to be a fair question. When all the evidence points to know, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Of course, when you're from a place where nothing seems to happen and no one seems to care, you tend to highlight the things that might otherwise be silly or inconsequential. I remember when I moved to Birmingham for college, I made sure that everybody knew that I was from the town with the world's only monument to a pest. <laughs> and if you don't know it, then you all must have failed Alabama history. The boll weevil. Can I tell you something? Most folks don't care. <laughs> Most folks don't know or care what a bull weevil is or why some town in lower Alabama, and you got to say lower Alabama, because if you tell people who are, ain't from here and say South Alabama, where do they think? Mobile. It ain't Mobile. I figure folks all over the world must have known about Enterprise. After all, when I was in the fourth grade, there was a picture of the boll weevil in a textbook. Surely everybody had heard of where I'm from. But when you're from a place few people have heard of, it's the small things that excite you. Like gathering around the television with family and friends, and you make the local paper because you got to audition for American Idol. And you were on for like five seconds. But everybody's there, gathered around the living room. And for the next year, everybody's going to talk about it. You know, my cousin, well, he ain't really my cousin, but, but we kind of related. He was on American Idol. Yeah, yeah. When you're from a small town, a community that's anything but famous, a country that's run down and left forgotten, when you're from some place like that, you tend to focus on those things that have the best chance of being more widely known. Those things that surely somebody outside of my zip code's heard of this, right? So I'm surprised. 
I'm surprised when Philip doesn't mention some of the things that they've got down at the Visitor's Bureau in Nazareth. I'm surprised that he doesn't try to build up Jesus' hometown just a little bit more to impress Nathaniel. Nazareth? Oh yeah, Nazareth. You know, you know they got a cookout in Nazareth. You heard of them? First one in the, in the, Georgia, in the Judean Valley. That's it. No, he doesn't say it. But maybe, maybe I'm more surprised that Philip doesn't try to explain what it is he sees in this rabbi with a common name from a forgettable town. I mean, why doesn't Philip give his testimony here? Why doesn't Philip tell Nathaniel about how he, maybe like the Apostle Paul, was on the road to somewhere when he was struck blind and heard a booming voice from heaven, Philip, Philip, why doesn't he do that? Why doesn't he tell Nathaniel about the way his, his hands used to tremor, how his back was bent over, and how he, he couldn't talk until Jesus, this Jesus from Nazareth, touched him? Why doesn't he tell Nathaniel about the mysterious check and the little bottle of spring water he got in his mailbox a week after following this teaching rabbi? Why doesn't Philip tell Nathaniel about how he kicked the habit without counseling, without 12 steps, without rehab, all when he met this son of Joseph from nowhere. After all, that's the way you get them. That's the way you get folks, right? That's how you get them to walk the aisle. That's how you get them in the baptistry, to pledge money, to join the church, to make a decision. You got to have a good hook, a good story, especially if the one you're trying to sell them is a nobody from nowhere. But Philip doesn't do any of that. He doesn't try to, to sell Nathaniel on the merits of Nazareth. He doesn't try to sell him a good story or share a moving testimony. What does he do? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see. Come and see. What, what is it? What is it? Come and see. Can't you just tell me? No, no, come and see. Is it worth getting up from a, from a lazy book? Come and see. Will it make me mad? <laughs> come and see. Will it change my life? Come and see. Is it worth all the fuss? Come and see. You know, I've found that the things in this life that are truly wonderful, the things in this life that truly exceed my expectations, the things that really make this life worth living are things that just defy description. I can tell you all about the dirt road where I spent most of my childhood memories, about the old woman in the Jim Walter house on the right who used to whip me and my cousins with a limb from a peach tree for wrestling in the living room. But if you want to really know what it was like, well, you got to go down there yourself and see what's left of it. I can try to describe to you what the air smells like in Port-au-Prince. The way the smiles from strangers and the laughs of children can melt any sort of ignorant prejudice that so many people seem to harbor. But really, you got to go and see it yourself. I can try to paint a picture of you for you what it's like for a couple dozen people to be gathered around some plastic folding tables passing uh, tamales and homemade hot sauce and drinking cold Sprite and Dr. Pepper after a hot morning's work. But really, if you want to know what it's like, come and see. I could tell you about how a nobody from nowhere with nothing I wrote in here, don't cry, sissy. <laughs> I can tell you all about how nobody from nowhere had his life turned upside down and inside out. But really, the best thing I can tell you, the best thing I can tell you, if you want to know about him, this stranger, this nobody from nowhere, if you want to know what it's like to have your horizon stretched farther than you ever thought possible, if you want to know what it's like 
to have joy indescribable and frustrations deeper than you ever thought imaginable. If you want to know what it's like to have life unbelievable, if you want to know what it's like to live each day for somebody other than yourself, then all I can say to you is come and see. All I can say is come and see. Is it going to make you mad? Come and see. Is it going to make you happy? Come and see. Is it going to take everything you got? Come and see. Are people going to abuse you? Come and see. Are people going to take advantage of you? Come and see. Is it worth it? Come and see. Come and see. Is this whole Jesus thing, giving myself up to take on more of everybody else, to give myself up to take on more of who Jesus is, is all of this junk really worth it? Can anything good come out of all of this? Come and see. Come and see. Let's pray together. Lord, you have set the words before us to come and see. What are we looking for? And your voice calls back, come and see. When all the questions we have about, is this life worth living? Is this faith worth having? Is each day worth our effort? We hear your voice say, come and see. May we hear your voice. And Lord, for others, may we be the voice that says, come and see. Lord, you call us. So may we have feet to come and eyes to see. In your name we pray. Amen.